Well, Chris is back. Daryl's going to take a couple of weeks yet to get back on the uh, on, on the video team or the podcast team. But uh, Chris, welcome back. I, I hope Thanks. you had some good. Where, where have you been traveling? Why don't you just give us a just a quick overview? Well, kind of on an impulse, uh, we we signed up for a trip to go see an eclipse, a solar eclipse. So that was one of the things that we've been doing. We, uh, we, we uh, had the chance to see the total solar eclipse of the sun from a ship off the coast of Mazatlan, which was beautiful. And then my mother and father-in-law are on, on an around the world cruise. And they're of a, as not, not surprising, probably looking at me, they're, they're of an older age and we were a little worried about them and we were able to join them for part of that trip between Tokyo and Singapore. And so we, uh, got to look after them for a little bit and see that they were well taken care of and come home with some more greater peace of mind. <laughs> so that's, those are the two places Great. we've been recently and they were a lot of fun. We got to go to on the, the one with the solar eclipse. We went through Hawaii and Victoria and Vancouver too. So that was really fun. Oh, yeah. wonderful. And how do you keep from gaining weight on those, uh, on those ships? Well, you know, it's, um, it's like annual rebalancing. So <laughs> I, 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 uh, I think I picked up over those two trips about 10 pounds and now, now I'm rebalancing. <laughs> okay. I'm down That's about three or four already and I'm on my way back to, uh, getting to my normal weight. Good for you. Good for you. Well, uh, as our viewers may note, I have a new a new office or a new room where I'm doing uh, uh, the podcasts and the videos. Uh, this used to be my wife's uh, office, and uh, she has now taken my office up the stairs. So she is the one now climbing <laughs> the stairs, and uh, and I'm here on the main floor, uh, thanks to her, and it. Uh, it actually feels very cozy, and I, I, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. So we have a couple of topics today that I think are are really going to help some of our viewers. Uh, Chris, you did two really fine presentations. Uh, I didn't listen to the podcast. I watched the videos. Uh, uh, but the one on best-in-class uh, ETFs and uh, and the other on two funds for life, and I, I know we've had a number of questions, and I get a lot of questions uh, just in in talking to people on the phone um, about about both of those topics. But first of all, uh, I've got to say thank you, and all anybody has to do is take a look at the comments underneath your presentations to know how at least. Uh, a handful, or more than a handful, but a lot of people really appreciated uh, the teaching that you did, Chris, and and uh, so uh, really thank you for that. But I think there are some things that would be worthwhile, kind of taking some time to walk through uh, uh, on each of them. And so I would like, if we can, to uh, to start the topic on the on the two funds. For life, because uh, I, I think that's the area where we're appealing to a lot of folks who don't want to have to dig into picking ETFs or mutual funds or the sort, but uh, want to make it dirt simple, uh, as simple as can be. Uh, and and I had the 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 pleasure this week of talking to about sixty uh, doctors and other healthcare workers at a Permanente, Permanente uh, Medical uh, Office at, down in California. And um, it made me dig into another target date fund, which I'm anxious to, to share with you and to, and to share with, uh, uh, with our folks who follow that work. So let's talk two funds for life. Um, when you first came up with this idea back in 2000, 17 or 18, uh, and started working on it. Uh, the first, the, the first strategy I thought was, was, was brilliant. And that was to 
determine the amount of small cap value in a portfolio that is going to be some combination for most people who follow it of small cap value and a target date fund. And um, uh, and the and the way that you put that together, you used a multiple of 1.5 times your age, and that would be how much you have in the target date fund and the balance in small cap value, which means if you were a 20-year-old, it means 30% is going to be in the target date fund conservatively, and the other 70% more aggressively in the small cap value uh, fund. And then as you're 40 and 50 and 60, the 1.5 means you're holding less and less uh, of the small cap value. Now, that was, I think, the first approach that you used. And uh, it may have been uncomfortable for some people to have 70% or, or, or 60% or 50% of their money in small cap value, but that was the way it was worked because it worked because you believed that when we're young, that it's okay to have that greater exposure to that small cap value. And when we're old, it's okay to have less. So then later you changed it. I mean, not only did you add the 10 and the 20% um, uh, to the portfolio instead of doing the 1.5 times, but then for a while you used one or you added 1.5 times the years to retirement. So you've got basically three ways to, to, to manage this. Talk us through some of that history and how you, you came upon and how you modified and now kind of where you feel is the sweet spot for the two funds for life. Yeah, you're you're bringing up all my dirty laundry. I, uh, you know, if I if I knew the end from the beginning, I uh, it would have helped probably many of our students and me in writing the book and everything else. Um, you know, the uh, the starting point you and I collaborated on, and we and 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 I still like it as a starting point. Uh, when I wrote the book, I tested a much wider range of possibilities. And uh, I, I learned some things. I mean, it took, it took a good year or two of research in writing the book. And we discovered some things along the way, and we also acknowledged some things along the way. Uh, perhaps the biggest thing to acknowledge is that not everybody retires at 65. If you're a, a fire person, financial independence, retire early, maybe your retirement date is 50. Maybe it's 40. Uh, so having the one and a half times age so that you get to the mature uh, point in the target date fund, it's retirement date, and you drive the small cap value to zero around that date at age 65 doesn't work for everyone. But if you use retirement age instead as a multiplier, and uh, you do one and a half times years to retirement in the target date fund, so you kind of flip it around. Now that works for people regardless of the retirement date. So so that was part of it was just acknowledging that not everybody's going to retire at 65. Um, but as I ran the back tests, one of the things you find is that that increased allocation in the early years doesn't make as big a difference as you might think, because you have zero dollars <laughs> or a few dollars. Yeah. And so uh, that kind of leads you down the path of, well, maybe, maybe you want to have uh, an allocation that's greater in the later years in retirement. And when you test that, you find out that that actually improves the safe withdrawal rate, which is, uh, that's a good thing for retirees. It's actually, although they may experience deeper drawdowns and greater fluctuations in the balance of their account, their account, at least historically, would have been more resilient because it's more diversified. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, so, so that led us to consider the, like the very aggressive approach we have in the, in the book where you have a multiplier and we actually have a higher multiplier, two and a half times age or times re uh, years to retirement with a 20% floor so that you keep some in retirement. 
Um, and then, you know, if you, if you really think about it, um, all of the other portfolios we have are half in small and half in value. So you could go half in the target date fund and half in small cap value, and you wouldn't be any more aggressively tilted to small in value than we are in the rest of the portfolios we recommend. And, uh, and so that, that's an interesting thought, you know, is just that maybe we're being too conservative in how we're nudging people. And then the final, the final piece is I'd really, really, really like to get to a point where Daryl includes something to do with sm- uh, two funds for life. And to do that, you have to think of it as a constant allocation. Um, so, you know, this idea that you would add 10% of small cap value and hold it throughout or 20%. We included that in the book, but you could also add this scenario of 30%, 40%, 50%. And that's what I've put in the fine tuning table that is now available in the portfolio configurator. And I think those have this advantage that they're simple and easy to understand. And uh, if I was to go back to the beginning of all of this work and think about it, that's probably the piece that concerns me the most is that uh, a lot of it is too complicated for people to easily understand. Now, we have really dedicated, smart people who follow our work who are doing it just fine. And I compliment them. Uh, That's that's great. And especially if it's working for them. But but I think that. Uh, a broader audience would probably need something simpler. And that's, that's where I like this idea of just the, the fixed fine tuning allocation table that you can look at. And I'll pull that up. I'll pull that up. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. So if we go to the website and we go over to portfolios uh, and then down to portfolio configurator, uh, this lets us, uh, generate portfolios based on our best in class ETF recommendations for both the um, sound investing portfolios that we have, like the ultimate buy and hold, worldwide four fund, and all of those, or for two fund for two funds for life. And in addition, I have here a two funds for life fine tuning tab over on the left hand side, and if we click that you can see for a variety of combinations of small cap value and target date fund down the left hand side we've characterized at different points in the glide path very early say for like a 2050 2065 target date fund um, to you know all the way through to retirement where you're zero years to retirement like a 2025 target date fund or all the way into retirement like a 2015 target date fund and for all of those combinations on this chart we tell you what the historical compound rate of return was what the worst 10-year compound rate of return was or compound annual growth rate kager the standard deviation or how volatile it's been, the worst drawdown that we've seen since 1970, and the 30-year safe, safe withdrawal rate going back to 1928. And so somebody can look at this and say, well, if I've signed up just for the target date fund, you know, this is the ride I would expect as I go through the glide path of the target date fund and it's managed for me. Or if I add 10% small cap value, and rebalance annually, then I get a different set of answers or all the way up to, you know, the 50-50. So, and, and somebody doesn't have to go straight across the chart. You can, you can stay in a box by changing your target date fund over time. You can, you can move up and down in the chart over time. Um, I think this is easier to understand. And I think it for uh, one of the one of my great aspirations is for Daryl, if he wanted to add this to any of the tables he already creates, all he has to do is pick up an asset allocation here, and we could start to get to the point where we have an apples to apples comparison for uh, some of the the uh, sound investing portfolios that we do, as well as the two funds for life, 
And I think that would be an interesting place to get to. That's that's one of my big aspirations. Yeah. So so Chris, to to dig it just a little bit deeper into this table, because uh there are all sorts of hopeful lessons here. Let's looking at the zero small cap value, a hundred percent target date fund. Uh for people who are 25 or more years away from retirement, during that period of time, it shows a 9.8% compound rate of return. Now, as I understand it, that number is, uh, is created by averaging a whole bunch of different periods of time. Tell us about what you use to create to get that 9.8%. To get that 9.8%, uh, what I did was I, I – actually, it's pretty simple. I just took the asset allocation of the target date fund uh, since 1970. So it's it's just one period of time, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's a uh, – 10% allocation, since it's based on Vanguard, it's a 10% allocation to bonds. Uh, it's a 36% allocation to international large cap blend, or that could be total stock market, It'd be about the same uh, same return, and uh, 54% to the total U.S. stock market. The only reason I used international large cap blend is that that's a uh, an asset class that we use in our other portfolios, so that return sequence is available. But um, yeah, that 9.8% is just for a fixed portfolio over the history we have since 1970. And and the worst uh, uh, 10 years, uh, is that a starting a calendar year? or That is the worst 10 years starting uh, by calendar year. And the reason yeah. I know that is that the way this table was built is on annual returns, assuming annual rebalancing. So there weren't any, there wasn't monthly data in this table. Yeah. Got it. Okay. That's great. But what, what I do see is as we start adding 10% small cap value, the worst 10 years gets, gets better. Yes. Uh, and that, I think that's meaningful because we're always about figuring out how to, Put it together so people stay the course, and the worst of times are tip. That's a, typically the place where people uh, decide to quit. And uh, by the time you're into thirty percent small cap value, uh, you go from one point one percent return to three point two percent return. So you've you've tripled uh, the compound rate of return there. Um, and and what is the easiest way to get a sense of how the risk compares in those in those two situations the 0% small cap value and the 30% i think the most intuitive way to see the risk is probably the worst case drawdown so for the 100% target date fund that was 48% and for the 30% Small cap value, 70% target date fund, that worst case, case drawdown was 51%. Uh, so even, even though the volatility went from 13.4% to 14.8% standard deviation, so that's yeah. the variability of the returns, the drawdown didn't get that much worse. And the reason is that some of the volatility uh, increases to the upside. And you don't really care about that that much. I mean, we like I'll take all the volatility to the upside you want to give me. I'll take as much of that as you want to give me. It's the volatility to the downside that really matters. And the worst case drawdown in this chart to better measure of that. And uh, and we did uh, a study where a fine tuning table where we compared all the different combinations of small cap value and. S and P five hundred in ten percent increments, and what did surprise me was that the fifty fifty strategy 
with the S and P five hundred and and the small cap value. The risk when we looked at things like uh, average return, uh, average loss in a losing year, and and uh, the things that uh, might uh, uh, create some sort of emotional response. Actually, there were you were better with 50-50 than you were with the S&P 500. Uh, and the reason is it's more meaningfully diversified. The S&P 500 exposes you to market risk. That's the only thing you get. Uh, and and the target date fund is the same same way in the early years. It gives you just a little bit of exposure to to uh, risk factors associated with bonds, but it's so small with that ten percent that it's it's not much. Almost all of the expo all all of the growth potential you're getting is coming from exposure to market risk. Yeah. And when you add in small cap value, now you're getting exposure to the size risk, to the value risk, to uh, if you pick right, maybe quality as well. And so you have instead of having a one cylinder engine, you got a three cylinder or a four cylinder engine and it it's gonna run smoother. That's that's the gist of it. Yeah. So so I'm glad you took it all the way to 50%. Uh and and uh it, it may not be comfortable for a 60 year old, but uh I would certainly think if a somebody in their twenties or thirties took a, a look at that other table uh that it would it would be meaningful i i was pleasantly surprised i'm always looking for an extra half of one percent for the folks that follow our work because we know that compounded that is meaningful uh and the question is uh is what we're saying should lead to a half a percent actually probable i see here that adding every 10% uh, of small cap value uh, does give a legitimate shot at about an extra half of 1%. That's cool. And I think that's probable. What I, what, what I, I, I agree. It may take you a number of years to get it right. I mean, that's, yeah. we know that that's one of the, one of the challenges with small cap values. You have to tolerate, long periods of uh, not getting the premium, but uh, it if you have the discipline to stick with it, I agree with you that there's, there is a very high likelihood it's going to help you out. So then when I spoke to the, the doctors and the healthcare workers this week, because their 401k plan had uh, black, uh, BlackRock instead of Vanguard. And uh, we have shown BlackRock in our presentations for years just to show people there's a difference between uh, how people may decide to manage a target date fund. But it forced me to look a little closer. And, and I asked myself, because BlackRock doesn't have any, any, any bonds in the portfolio in the early years, and also... Because in the latter years, like right now at, at my age, uh, Vanguard would have me 30% in equity and BlackRock ha would have me 40. And BlackRock has no fixed income in those early years and Vanguard has 10%. So I, I said, wow, that is starting to, to look like another half of 1% potentially. Yeah. And so I just, I mean, I, these numbers are not statistically meaningful because the period of time is so short. But I, in preparation for that meeting, I just took a look quickly at the last uh, about four and a half years. Why? Because I could look at AVUV along with these, uh, these two uh, target date funds. But without AVUV, the compound rate of return for Vanguard was 9.02 i was looking at a 2065 and uh and and for blackrock 9.52 i mean it was like it knew i wanted an extra half a percent and um and, and then i looked at adding 10 percent avuv uh, to the portfolio uh using blackrock and in fact it takes the return up to about 10.1 another half a percent. 
And then I looked at going to 20%, another half a percent. In fact, six six tenths of one percent. And 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 so it it made me realize we need to to look beyond Vanguard. When we talk to people about target date funds, we need to look beyond and other beyond Vanguard to other sources of index based. I'm not looking for active management because I think we lose a half a percent there, but index based uh, where they are using closer to what we would like to have them using, and that is uh, no fixed income in the early years. Is there anything in that story that you think could be a little bit misleading? I don't think so. I I, I agree with you that the more aggressive approach of the BlackRock target date fund glide path is likely to lead to a higher return. It's going to have a little higher volatility as you go along as well. And if you're being aggressive about your plan and you're going to go 50-50, 50% small cap value, 50% target date fund, the difference would be small because now you're going to take a 10% allocation and divide it by two. So you only have a 5% allocation to bonds, even with Vanguard. Um, And instead of having a 10% equity allocation difference in retirement, it goes to a 5%. So uh, it kind of depends on where you want to be. The the biggest reason I don't put a lot of time and energy into evaluating best-in-class target date funds is that I know for most people, they don't have a choice. For most people, you're offered one target date fund family in your uh, 401k or your employer's plan. And that's that's all you've got. And so knowing that there's something better on the other side of the fence, it it, it might be just too hard to get it for you. Yeah. But I do think we should emphasize more often probably that, you know, an expensive, uh, a, a target date fund with a high expense ratio could undo all of the benefits. And that would be a bad thing. You'd be better off managing your own glide path in that circumstance. Um, But between BlackRock and Vanguard, I think a lot of people could be very successful looking at this table, using it as an approximation to set expectations and then moving ahead. And uh, it's really, like you said, it's the actively managed expensive funds. That's where I think it gets the hackles up on our neck and we go, no, 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 don't do that. Yeah. And by the way, we do have people uh, still questioning uh, the idea of using uh, the Avantis funds, AVUV, in the case of the small cap value, uh, because they're expensive and they could get a mutual fund or an ETF at uh, at Vanguard for uh, about one third, uh, two thirds less cost. And and while we're on this topic, why don't you address please that that decision and why it makes sense if it does uh, to pay a quarter of one percent instead of seven tenths of one percent i'm sorry seven one hundredths of one percent well uh, what we know about avantis's approach is that they filter not just on size and value but they also filter on quality and and momentum. DFA also filters on momentum. And we know that historically, uh, momentum and quality have both been worth uh, several percentage points. We'll just we'll just leave it at three-ish percentage points or more. And I'm I'm underestimating by a lot. Uh, I think quality is actually closer to five and momentum might be five or six. So let's just say for a second, though, that there were three percentage points each. And let's say that in both cases, you you only get a quarter of that three percentage points. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, a quarter of three is 0.75%. And if you get them both, that's one and a half percent. So is it worth paying... in an expense ratio to get potentially another one and a half percent in return. That's, that's the gist of what 
what we do when we analyze the best in class ETFs is we look at how much exposure do you get to these different risk factors that have a historical uh, track record of generating returns, not just uh, in the US, but internationally, globally, across markets, across asset classes. And how much more of it do you get relative to what you pay? And if it looks like what you get is worth more than what you pay, then that that starts to look like a good investment. So yeah, I you could get a cheaper fund, um, but I, I think you would give up this potential return and diversification. So that's the other thing we know is if you have a portfolio that has exposure to more of these risk factors, it's going to deliver more consistently over time. Uh, where if you have a, a portfolio that's only firing on one cylinder, going back to my engine analogy, you know, just market or just market and size or market and size and value, it's going to be less consistent in delivering those returns. At least it has been in the past. There's no guarantees in the future. But in the past, over long periods of time, it seems like you're better off having exposure to a wider range of these. And so I feel very comfortable with that quarter of a percent that it's it's money well spent. That's great. And and a lot of these people in their 401k, had, they have target date funds, but they don't have small cap value. And when we do find small cap value, they're very often actively managed small cap value because some manager did better than the index. And uh, and that qualifies to, to, to them to be best in class when the trustees pick it. And of course, we'd rather have them uh, going into an index fund, but but so what they end up doing is having to find that small cap value, maybe in an IRA, maybe a regular IRA, maybe a Roth IRA, becomes a little more complex to try to manage. But how do you feel? And I don't know what you could say about expected additional return, but if somebody is 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 building that. So it's, it's hard to rebalance uh, and and that they basically, other than maybe what they maybe what they put in could be used as a way of rebalancing, I suspect. But just the idea that one might be putting away 10 percent or 20 percent a year through through a Roth and and just let it go. Don't rebalance the implications of that over a long period of time would look like what, Chris? Well, just to clarify, when you say putting 10% or 20% into the Roth, I think what you're saying is 10 or 20% of their total retirement savings, right? So yes, I've, yes. I've thought often that, you know, if somebody's saving 10% towards retirement, a dime out of every dollar, now you're talking about putting one or two of the pennies out of the dime into the uh, the the Roth IRA or the, the traditional IRA. I, so uh, the way I think it would likely play out is that um, either it's going to underperform or outperform. And in any given year, that's a flip of a coin. And so hopefully if it underperforms, they've learned enough to know they should stay the course and keep putting that percentage in. And if, as we would expect over time at a 10 year horizon, a 15 year horizon, a 20 year horizon, it has outperformed you're right that they could rebalance by putting nothing in that year or putting less in. What I would like to think, though, is that as they gain confidence in the the asset class, that they would stick with it. They'd say, you know, hey, this thing seems to be working. I'll continue putting putting my 10 percent or 20 percent of my retirement savings into small cap value. Now, what that means for the portfolio overall is that it becomes more volatile because if you if you have a uh, a higher allocation to this more volatile asset then you're going to see deeper potential worst case drawdowns and more variation in your annual returns and so you don't want to exceed your ability to stomach that and stick with it but uh you know hopefully if as you get to those near years of retirement you're an oversaver at that point and you've got more than you need maybe you have a higher capacity than to tolerate some of that volatility as well. But that's a very personal thing. And if you feel like 
you, you know, if an investor feels like the volatility is getting to be too big for them, they could rebalance even within the uh, the IRA. They could go in and rebalance. They could say, you know, I'm going to take a percentage of this small cap value and move it into large cap blend uh, to to balance things out. And they wouldn't have tax implications or or capital gains to realize. So they could do that as well, or even even incorporate some fixed income if needed. And I think we give them all the tools to figure that out uh, if you look at the portfolio as a whole. So I think they have a lot of levers. It's a, I think it's a great strategy. Um, and uh, it's, it's impossible for me to model all the scenarios that would happen. But I, I think there's enough positive options down that path that it's a good one. Uh, let's put that table back up just one more time and see if there isn't one more lesson on there that uh, uh, we can leave for our, our, I keep using the word students. I don't know if that is demeaning or not, but <laughs> the people who are looking to us to, to, to learn something. Um, when I look at this table, and we're talking about the 25-year-old uh, um, person that, that that gentleman was asking about, uh, how do we use this table to create a lifetime uh, of returns? Uh, I think most of our folks know how to use a calculator. Uh, they can't go to our uh, lifetime investment calculator to do that with 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 the target date funds at this point. But walk us through what how you would show those twenty five year olds how they would likely do over a lifetime. Well, it's it, it's a tricky, a little bit of a tricky math problem because uh, what you're going to get is uh, whatever box you're in uh, over time, if you stay in a, you know, let, let's just take the simplest case, the target date fund. Let's say you go 100% in the target date fund throughout your life. Well, when you're age 25, you're going to get uh, historically an expected compound annual growth rate uh, of 9.8% with this, this drawdown. When you have a little bit more money, you're going to get a little bit lower return and so forth and so, so on across the chart. And when you're nearing retirement and you have the greatest amount of money, you're going to be getting these returns of 9.0, 8.7, and 8.0%. It's, it's really hard without building an Excel spreadsheet and putting in uh, some savings rate and then following through with what you think the uh, compound rates of return are to say what, what your total would be, what your total experience would be. And uh, that's, that's why in the book I, uh, I ran – all of these different scenarios with rolling start dates was so you could get an idea of what the history says a bad luck scenario would be, a medium luck scenario, a good luck scenario. Um, I think, though, that, you know, what people are going to try to do probably is get the best return that they can at any point in time for whatever their risk tolerance and capacity is. So we know that our risk capacity declines over time because we have fewer years to work. And so we should probably be seeing the volatility and the worst drawdowns decline as we get closer to retirement. Plus, we're probably more nervous about the size of the balance. Yeah. But within that constraint, there's also an emotional component which you know, you've brought up with your fine tuning tables that as an advisor, you sat across the table and talked to people and said, you know, would you be okay losing 50% of your retirement savings? Mm -hmm. And the truth is most of us probably overestimate by a little bit what that capacity is because it's easier in the abstract to say you could tolerate something than in the concrete mm -hmm. when the market has gone down 50% and there's no evidence it's ready to turn around. That's, that's when it's really, really hard for people. And so I think people are going to look at this chart and they're going to find their comfort zone year by year, year as they go across it. 
And that may mean moving up and down on the chart in the amount that they have allocated to small cap value. It may mean just riding all the way across in a row. And um, in terms of their expectations of return, um, it's going to be that dollar weighted average, um, which depends on how fast they save at different ages and what their luck has been. Yeah, it's it's hard. It's a hard question to answer. Got it. By the way, I, I, I just realized that there are a couple more uh, two funds for life questions that 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 uh, could be quickly, quickly. I'm uh, game. And, I'm game. OK, good. Uh, and that is in the small cap value. Would you would would you be endorsing a combination of of uh, international and U.S. small cap value as opposed to only U.S.? Yes. And I think that that comes down to a personal preference and comfort level. The target date fund is going to give you international diversification already. It probably will tilt to the United States. Uh, so if you want to maintain the same allocation that the target date fund has, uh, you know, say something like a 65, 35, I think that's close to what Vanguard has right now. Uh, you could do that same allocation between a mm -hmm. U.S. small cap value and international small cap value. Or if you feel uncomfortable with the target date fund tilting too much internationally, you might decide to be 100% small cap value in the U.S., 100% U.S. in small cap value. So I, I think that's a personal thing. Uh, it I It's hard with any... Uh, statistical significance to say how that's going to change the return because we just don't have enough history on international asset classes compared to the United States. And, and uh, we, we do have tables, fine tuning tables for a worldwide small cap value portfolio so that uh, both 50, 50 and 70, 30. Yes, so we do. You can go check those out. Uh, on the page, uh, the fine tuning your asset allocation uh, page on our in the boot camp. Um, you know something? I think I think we've done it, Chris. As always, you've done a great job, and appreciate your your time. And we'll get back together, and we'll be talking to them about uh, best in class. Um, I know, I know one of them, they want to know right now. They want to know, they do not want to wait. They want to know when you are going to update the list of, uh, ETF recommendations. I will update it at the beginning of 2025. I'm going to stick with my two year cycle. I haven't seen anything yet to make me think we need any kind of interim update. Uh, I feel like the recommendations we have there are still very solid. And uh, one of the challenges, because a lot of people, they see a new fund and they want me to evaluate it right away and say, you know, is this better or worse? One of the challenges is a lot of times there's, there's not enough history. Uh, there's not enough time to analyze, to really know what the fund is doing, how it's per performing. And a lot of times that goes along with a lack of liquidity too. Uh, when a fund is new, the assets under management are small. You can see bigger bid ask spreads, and that makes it harder to trade efficiently without paying a penalty to the smarter trader on the other side of the trade. So uh, I, I think by the time 2025 rolls around, we'll have some interesting new candidates that have enough history and enough assets under management that that will be a worthwhile exercise. But for now, I, I think we've got great recommendations and still very comfortable with them. Great. Chris, thank you very much. Thank you to all of you who join us uh, on a, a regular basis. Uh, you know, the, the one of the best things you can do to help us uh, is to share this information uh, with others. And by the way, many of you have recently sent uh, uh, donations to help us in our work. That is greatly appreciated. And we are a 50. C3 uh, nonprofit, so it is, if if appropriate, tax deductible. But but most of all, we really appreciate having the opportunity to to help you and uh, and your family. Good luck. <laughs>